recording. Um, the first thing that uh, I want to kind of talk about is um, YouTube. So I know that there's a portion of you who are um, probably not excited about the modeling part. But we're going to have to kind of get through that anyway. And that's why I kind of dedicate a few days to talking about modeling, talking about different elements of that. I have a handful of modeling videos on the YouTube page. If you go to my channel, um, actually, they're kind of hard to find because they're way down here. Um, but eventually, I think you can actually search this page, right? Um, just going to search all of YouTube. Is it this one here? There we go. There we go. So I have a handful of different um, lectures about modeling. Um, these two here are pretty old, but I would consider watching those. The basic poly modeling tools and the poly modeling tools too. Um, I um, at one point was teaching a 3D modeling class. Um, here and um, these are some videos I made for that. I, I will say that the basic modeling tools is probably the most beneficial one. I have it, should have it muted now. Um, but basically I just go through all of these different elements that um, will help you make better models, right? Um, it's about a 30 minute video, but I think I cover like somewhere between 11, 15 different tools um, that are all pretty substantial. This is going to be way more efficient than watching me do it in class, forgetting it, and then trying to figure it out even later. Just look up this video. It's on the Greg Marlow Learning page. And I just go through a lot of different stuff. So like what I'm doing here, for example, is extruding along a curve. And so um, that allowed me to just get a very complicated looking model there in under a minute. Like that, that model like happened pretty quickly. And, um, and there should be. Um, Anyway, just, just watch the video if you're interested in that. Some of the other stuff I go over, in the class I had my, um, my students were trying to create a, oh, thank you, a Dremel tool. Like I had I give them, given, given them a, um, some pictures of this Dremel tool and they were trying to model it and they were doing stuff like this, right? Like they're like, it has a lot of detail, I'm gonna make a lot of detail. Right, and then I'm going to start there. Right, and so that's really the um, the the thing I want to talk about the most is you don't need to do that. Right, in fact, like you should start off with the least amount of detail possible um, because then you're going to be able to get the overall shape of the object and then start refining the detail from there. Um, if you are Needing more modeling help, I'd be more than happy to sit down and help you with um, certain objects you're having trouble getting that form. The other thing that you should consider um, working with is the Nomen. Actually, let me just go to D2L. D2L. ETSU D2L. Um, and in our 3D animation class here, I have the explanation of how you get into the, the Nomen workshops um, to see how those work. Um, I'm gonna see if I can log in on mine really quick. I think it'll automatically log me in. It will. These are all licenses are in use. So it's busy right now. We only have 32 licenses for the full school or for the whole department, right? Um, if that becomes an issue, if we're always getting the all the licenses are in use, um, that's okay. Basically, just wait for a little while. Somebody will log out, and we can we can use it again. But there are quite a few modeling tutorials in there, and frankly, um, this is going to sound crazy, but Autodesk Maya has their own. Um, YouTube page, and I am subscribed to it. I think yeah, here we go. It's the Maya Learning Channel, right? And there's a lot of stuff in here, um, and it's not 
bad. I mean, like, there's actually some pretty good stuff in here. So, um, if what you're wanting is just sort of some basic um, modeling tutorials, this may be a good place to start, but they go through the entire spectrum. Um, so, what we're going to talk about mainly today is um, box modeling, right? Like, that is a phrase that you may not hear um, terribly often anymore. Most of the time when, you, when people start talking about modeling, very soon that leads to sculpting. And sculpting is sort of the primary way that we do a lot of our form construction for particularly organic objects. ZBrush is trying to push its way into the hard surface modeling arena. I think it's doing a great job of it. And Maya needs to, frankly, like pick up the slack and get a little bit better, right? Um, ZBrush has a, a relatively high learning curve, but how many of you have used ZBrush in the past? All right. I will say that ZBrush is not the only sculpting tool. And if you're wanting to do some sculpting and you're overwhelmed by ZBrush, um, Mudbox is the gateway drug to sculpting, right? Um, Mudbox is right, all of the same shortcut keys as Maya. It takes a very low investment on your part to actually get in there and start being able to get some sculpting done. That's actually probably what we're going to go over in next class. I'm not going to teach you ZBrush all the way from the scratch in a 3D animation class. Um, if you're really interested in that, modeling for entertainment is is really probably the, the class of things. Like, anybody in modeling for entertainment right now? Yeah. Yeah, we're just doing Maya right now. I would imagine you would have eventually. Um, yeah. But I. I, 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 I really? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think they took. I mean, I don't know where else it's going to be taught. It's not in there. I, 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 okay. Um, fair enough. I, I, there, I, I, can, I can give you some introductory stuff to ZBrush. Um, I knew they took it out of the principles of game design. I, th I thought it was still going to be a for a game, but it may be one of those things that it like, gets layered in by the end. Um, that's cool. Um, whatever. I can show you ZBrush, but I can also show you my box. Sculpting is the very intuitive way of getting a form. So when I taught modeling classes, there was a, um, a way that I taught it, because I recognized that what people mainly challenge, or what people mainly struggle with in modeling classes is that there are conflicting problematic elements to modeling. And so I broke it up into three different elements that you should focus on, right? And because we don't have a giant chalkboard for me to write it on, I wrote it in Word. Um, I guess I could have created a PowerPoint for this, but I like it. There's that whiteboard, but I'd have to erase Simba and Rafiki. Um, and that weird cylindrical character. So, <laughs> form flow function. I did not have to work very hard to find uh, the three F words um, that you will associate with modeling. There may be a fourth that you personally associate with modeling. Um, these are the three that you need to be thinking about. And I broke them up like this for a reason. They are all connected, but sometimes while you're trying to focus on one, the other one gets in your way, okay? So form is the first thing that we usually talk about in modeling. When you're modeling, you are trying to make a bunch of primitive objects look like more complicated objects, okay? And um, if you think about these separately, it makes that job a little easier. Primarily, Above all, the most important thing in modeling is that the object look the way you want it to look, right? Um, that you have obtained the correct form of that model, right? You, you're trying to replicate an object's shape, an object's volume, all of that. Form is the most important. And it's not terribly hard to get good form but have ridiculously nasty topo uh, topology. 
So the next section is flow, and that's like how do all of your edges flow um, within that form? And then the last one is function. And function is what is this model going to do? Okay? So to give you an example of that, if I have um, a scene that I'm going to render, right, um, and I need a really detailed rock, right, um, and it never has to be interactive, it doesn't matter what that topology looks like, it just matters what the form looks like. Because the function of that rock is to just sit there and look good, right? Um, it's going to render, so it's not going to slow down necessarily my, um, my interactivity time. I don't have to have like, uh, doesn't have to be low resolution, so it will play well in a game engine. It just has to be the right shape and look good, right? So this functionality is to just sit there and look good. So I don't care about the topology, I don't care about how it would deform because I'm never going to deform it. If I'm modeling a character that has to have um, deformation, right? The topology matters, right? The way that those edges flow through the model matters. Because its functionality is that eventually it's going to deform. And if its topology is incorrect, the deformation is going to be bad. Right? So this is the order you should also think of them. So let's look at these one at a time. Um, I like to make it interactive. Um, so you stop doing whatever it is on your computer and pay attention to me because I'm selfish. Um, so I like to pull up a bunch of models and talk. That's not how I want to do it. Does it let me go through them? And just talk about the good ones and the bad ones. Okay? So we've got a bunch of models here. Which one sticks out to you? Which ones, or which point at one, say the, the model, that strikes you as a good model? Vampire in the middle of the robot down at the bottom. So, which one? Merchant House, robot, and vampire. Merchant House. Vampire, robot. Why are those good models? So these two feel like good models because of complexity, right? Like if we look at that, that's got a lot of complexity in there. Um, it's a nice sculpt. Um, I don't know enough about the topology to know if it's a good model or not, um, but I think it is. Um, it's definitely got good form, right? We, we have, somebody has paid attention to trying to get very specific detail into this model, right? It looks like there's muscle under there and the skin is sort of stretching over top of it, right? So the form is very good. I don't know anything about the flow and I don't know anything about if this will work in terms of functionality, right? But we can say this is a strong form. Right? Now, um, if we look at this character, or this screen, whatever, right? How many of you think this is a, a pretty good model? Anybody? <laughs> I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just um, Why? That's why you didn't want to raise your hand, right? You thought I'd ask why. What? what?
So let's talk about that. Does it have, um, it, does this mean that the only thing that defines a good model is detail? No. Then, then what's some other things other than the detail that make this like appealing to look at? Well, yes. Right. The side of so, it. so the way they connect together like pulls interest, right? I got really like this little socket thing where the that extra gun holster is hanging beside it. I like how it has like the, the um, what is it called? It's front Do you see where the back legs are? Uh -huh. Most most like uh, not a lot of neck designs have like those. It, it's like a I don't know what you call it. It's like a cylinder, but it's like a like the socket? No, it's not a socket. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like right behind this leg. Um, behind this leg? Like here? No, like a little above it. A little above oh, like right here? Uh, a little more to the left. Can I, I don't know what you're Just talking about. Just around the back of the knee. Oh, like the hydraulic system? Yeah, the hydraulic system. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when we see something like that, the hydraulic system, we kind of see another one right here, right? I don't even have to know what that's for, but I get some indication that that has a purpose to be in, right? Um, I think something else that, uh, the, the two things I would have you like, kind of notice in this, um, and I think some of it is one of the weaknesses of this, is that um, the character silhouettes are a little confusing. Right? I can't necessarily tell for sure where its leg is, and is that other thing another leg? Like, what's in front of what? So the silhouette needs a little work in my opinion to, to clear it up. But what it does have is a nice mix of detail and um, and clear areas, right? There are areas where there's no real detail, like on that little like turret thing that comes off of the chest, right? There's a lot of smooth areas there, and then there's other areas that are really high in detail. And so it's just like um, anything else. The entire model isn't too busy, right? There are areas where it's busy, areas where it's it's simple, and that breaks it up. And, and like your your ability to look at it and clearly read it um, is part of what makes it a good model. So again, not only it's not only detail um, to to look at that house that Sean was talking about. Where are we at here? Right. This is actually a pretty low resolution house. It's very um, low resolution uh, assets. They go in there and you can tell. It's like that's not a lot of detail. Um, but this has the opposite of what's going on with that busy robot, which is they have clearly broken out these shapes to where we can read them. Right? It has a very strong silhouette and level of detail um, that, is, that is easy to read. Right? Um, and it's appealing, even though it's not that complex. Like, I like this, the, the ability to model all these shapes, everybody in this class has that, right? Um, what's really there is the design and the appeal of that model, right? <laughs> so I mean, I think some of this gets a little more complicated for us to determine of what's a good model or a bad model. Is that a good model or a bad model? <laughs> Has anybody seen the, the Simpsons? Um, yeah, like the Disney uh, does a lot of them. Oh, yeah, those little round Yeah. Like, they're freaking adorable, but they're just little cylinders with faces, right? Um, and so the, the question there is, is that a good model or a bad model? Right? And so I, huh? Because it worked, right? It, it is about whatever it is you're trying to communicate. They were trying to communicate something simple, but very easily achieved that with a simple form. So it's not just. Uh, I said they're, they're, they're very popular. So I have a I have a lot of style preferences, and this is one of the reasons I asked you to um, think about style, right? Is that I love stuff like this. Right. I just think this is freaking adorable. I love these characters. 
And they're not complex. It's not the complexity of it. It is in the success of the design and how clearly that design is communicated, kind of how cleanly that design is communicated. This is a very specific form. Right? They were going for a very specific form, and, and they executed it well. Right? So it's not, and I think I, this is important in this class because it's not that everything has to be photorealistic. Photorealistic is an option, but that's not the only thing that defines a good model work. Right? Um, so, like, who can spot some bad models now? <laughs> this is a new year. He is also simple. I feel bad. I'm recording this video, and now I'm worried. Like somebody's gonna be like watching my videos and be like, oh, "Who doesn't want that?" Uh, and if you did, speaking directly to you right now, keep up the hard work because it's possible that that sucks. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, you can do this. You can do this. You just got to keep working. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it's okay though. Like we all have to model this at some point, right? But you all are, you all should have gotten further along than this, right? Um, I think your robot by the end of principles was, was most likely better than that. But what makes that, like, it's simple though. It's a cylinder and some spheres, just like those other, just like this character. Why is that one bad and this one's good? Both of those are right. Like, one of the things that always strikes me in a bad model is when it looks like the program dictated the shape, right? Um, when I can still see elements of the primitive, and that doesn't seem like an intentional decision, it seems like a lack of um, artist control, then that strikes as a bad model, right? Like, this is like, I don't know how to model a torso, so I'm gonna make a cylinder. I don't know how to model an arm, so I'm gonna make a cylinder. I don't know how to model a head, so I'm gonna make a spear, but it needs a mouth, so I guess I'm gonna like extrude or something. Right? It just feels like there's no control. Um, they just like fought the program until they got something that they could say, I guess that kind of looks like a person. Uh, I'm going to call it done, right? And it's the lack of intent. I think that that's that's what makes um, that's what makes a lot of art look like bad. Um, I think we can start to see that in some of these other models that are that are not good. What's another one that you see that's not really impressive? The jet sort of box model thing. Yeah, the box model jet, right? Um, that's a box with what I can count is six extrusions. Right? Um, and then they smooth it. Right. Okay, we all have to get past that part, right? We've all like been able to get something like that. Right? Um, and to like maybe it's not that that jet is bad, like to me it's that jet is not done, right? Like they're trying to, they, they did a little bit of work, and now they're trying to get Maya to do the rest of it for them, and, and it's not going to, right? Um, Scroll down a little bit. So again, simple, but very clear in its execution, right? Um, and you can see like this has a style to it. This feels like intentional decisions for that simplicity, right? Um, a lot of times, um, the things that start to kill your model is when it looks like, um, let's say a character's leg um, is just a bunch of straight lines from the top to the bottom, right? Like, why is that straight? Right? Why, why, why are those edges straight? So even something like this little pillar that happens right here in your windshield has a little bit of like warp and deformation to it. All of those edges that are in there 
go into defining it. Now, now I will say that I think it has some topology issues that probably could be clarified. This one could be improved, but it's not a bad model, right? Um, again, like this, this is still, like, those heads are still just spheres for the most part, right? But they're very intentional feeling in how that implements into the design. And it's not just that they modeled spheres for heads because they couldn't model anything better. We can even see that that shape, that body shape, is a very specific shape. It looks like a, a sphere with a drop coming off of it, and that drop is what makes the body, right? So these are intentional decisions. And you would make most of these decisions at the uh, concept stage, right? When you were you know, looking for style boards, all of that stuff, that's when you're going to, to learn some of this. Um, so, and of course, proportion. Like, <laughs> like, goodness gracious, people, like, just look at another human being, right? Like, it's like, is that what a human being looks like? Uh, like, just scale the head up. Like, scale the feet down. Like, it, 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 some of this is just going to come from observation, I think. Okay. Um, and I want to point out that if you're interested, you can buy that model for the low, low price of only $18.75. Um, oh, I think it's $20. I know. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think I've been mean long enough to some of those people. So we got form. Um, one of the... Uh, One of the things that strikes me as um, most important in, in this form element, or, or it's the question I probably get the most, is should that be one object or two? Right? And I, I'm sure you run into that a lot. And I think that's probably being heavily informed by the software and probably um, maybe even the function a little bit. Right? You know like, what this is going to be. Are you going to send it to Unreal? Are you going to keep it in Maya? Are you going to animate it later? Should that be one object or two? The answer to me is always based off of how it, is, how it should be constructed in real life with a little bit of emphasis on what you're going to do with it, right? So like, for example, I've got a whole bunch of hard service models in here. Most of these are pretty good, right? Um, if we look at this one, I am confident that this is not one piece of mesh, right? This is probably hundreds of them, right? Um, every little bolt and screw in this is probably a different piece. Um, just because, like, why kill yourself on this effort to make all of that a single piece of topology What's the, what is the goal of that, right? In most cases, like, these elements will be actually different models, right? That window will be made out of something different than this metal is, right? And so that means you could break those off into two pieces. It makes material easy, or easier. It makes um, modeling that right topology easier. Um, and, like, to me, if... if Somebody who is um, competent but a handful of tools could take it apart and put it back together in real life, then you could probably model it in two pieces. The exception for that is when you are, when your goal for that object is something that uh, modeling it in multiple pieces makes it too heavy, right? So I, I had an example in here, um, like we have this, this vehicle, which is likely modeled in multiple pieces, um, it's for games, but it's for a pretty high resolution game, so I'm sure the wheels are different pieces, um, but these little bolts on the, uh, on the rear view mirror, maybe not, right? Versus this, which is probably going for mobile games, right? And you can tell that this is, for the most part, probably made up out of I think seven pieces, right? The entire car body is one piece. Each of the tires and wheels is a piece. And it looks like the rear view mirrors are separate pieces that are just kind of bashed into the, the side of the model. 
simply because your topology would get really um, yeah, messy, like a little bit denser if you were trying to get that out of one piece, right? Um, you're not going to notice that seam. And so instead of having the hood be a different piece, it's just all one piece, and they're kind of faking some of that with texture, right? Uh, for you, unless you're planning on rendering this in a game engine, which is an option, if you want to do your rendering with Unreal or Unity, that is an option, it just requires a little extra work on your part. Um, unless you're planning on doing that, like, this isn't ideal, right? This is probably for a mobile game or um, a game that, like, you need a lot of these in that scene at one time, right? Um, because they're kind of using a texture map to carry most of the heavy lifting on the modeling of this. Still a good model. Like, it's a very appealing model to look at. It's just low resolution. And so, in this case, you have to make a, a you have to weigh the um, costs and benefits of making this a full, like, high resolution model, right? If it is multiple pieces, though, then go ahead and model it as multiple pieces until it starts getting so heavy that it's going to impact your scene, right? So you have to make those decisions too, right? If your scene is this, like, um, 20 of these trucks racing through, um, you know, this, like, busy city, eventually your scene is going to have, like, 5 billion polygons in it, and then you're not going to be able to do anything. Um, so you kind of have to weigh that. You would also weigh the costs and benefits of like how close is this going to be. If this truck is driving across a bridge in the distant background, you don't need it this detail, right? You need it more like that car because it's just back and back driving across the bridge. Right? Okay, so I feel like we're kind of we're kind of covering a lot of this in form, flow, and function. What I want to do is take a minute or two and just sort of look at a few models. Um, that I've, I've kind of worked on, kind of showed you, showed you this one earlier. This is my character, super simple, um, not really a ton of detail, but you can see in here, if I turn on wireframe on shaded, you can see the topology on this. And it's dense enough that I'm gonna be able to get some deformation out of it, right? But still simple enough to where um, I was able to keep it light, and get a little bit of interesting form out of it, right? Um, one of the things when I talk about flow, it's how does your edges flow through this model, right? That is going to help you get a better form, right? So you'll notice little things here, like this section here, um, right? And it kind of comes to this five-pointed intersection right there. And I did that so I could get this little leg shape to feel a little bit separated um, and, and move forward. I, I did that so I could get that out of the form. Right? When it comes to function, when I start animating it, that means I'll be able to stretch that section forward a little bit. Um, you may notice that the eyes have some sort of rings that go around them. Right? Um, a lot of that is based off of um, actual muscle um, deformation. So um, how that is going to deform in the future, our muscle structure around our eyes and our mouth kind of flow in a circular manner because those are, um, I don't know what the plural of orifice is. Those are uh, facial openings, right, that have to get bigger or smaller, right? I have to be able to blink and squint. I have to be able to open my eyes really wide. The same with my mouth. I have to be able to say, um, the E shape and make it really wide. I have to be able to say ha ah, and I have to be able to say ooh, right? and, and all of those different shapes require my mouth opening to deform drastically. The best way to get those deformations is sort of this set of rings that go around that opening, right? Topology is the word we use to describe the way um, the model flows. Right? Um, I have some really good examples of strong topology, but you'll recognize that in something like this, our topology um, isn't just, it's not just a cylinder, right? Our arm is not made up of a cylinder, and that's because if it was, I would have to fight that topology in order to get this form, right? 
the form takes precedent of it. And since I need all of these bulging, very distinct muscle shapes, the topology, I, I didn't use this, the topology um, contorts to do that, right? Your topology works with you to get good form. In box modeling, though, it's that back and forth between your topology and your form, like your, your form and your flow, um, that is the, the challenge, right? Sometimes you have a very specific topology on your model, and you're trying to get a specific form to come out of that, and that's frustrating because it's hard to do, right? Um, that's really where the, the ch most of the challenges of modeling are. Most of the quote unquote bad models that we looked at, um, one of the reasons they were bad is because they ignored the fact that they needed a different flow of topology in order to get that form, and they tried to force the existing form to make that shape, right? That, that spherical character's mouth, it was just this weird stretched set of polygons, right? That, that's, that's what was happening, right? Topology is mainly about um, two things. One is um, how are those edges going to combine to help get the right shape? And then once they've combined, if this object needs to deform, how will this topology allow it to deform correctly, right? So we're seeing little things here that may not seem particularly intuitive, like um, there are extra spans at the bend point of each of the fingers, right? And that's because when you bend your fingers, that mesh is going to stretch and compress. And if you don't have enough topology right there, if not enough edge loops in that section, then your model is going to deform incorrectly. It's going to flatten out, it's going to lose volume. So any place where there's a lot of deformation, sometimes you need extra topology to help it retain its shape, right? So um, Pinterest is great for this because there's so many different examples of topology and how, um, how to get good topology, right? So I thought this one was kind of interesting. Um, that like how to get good topology for for shapes like this right um and and you can kind of see that sometimes when you need this very round shape like there's very specific ways you need to get those edges to flow okay sometimes that is just really hard to do okay i'm going to show you some tools here in the in the near future for retopologizing stuff um, I will show you right now in Maya, there's some tricks you can do um, that will allow you to change your, top oh, change your topology kind of, um, kind of quickly, right? So let's say um, this edge here, for some reason, I need that edge right there to not be going in that direction, but to be going diagonally across here. Like there's a manual way I could do this. I could go to mesh tools and I could do, oh wait, yeah, where is it, multi-cut? Is it in here? Yeah, multi-cut. Okay. And I could click here and go across like there, right? I did that wrong. So click there, there. So I get that. And then I could go through here and then hit control delete and get rid of those. And now I got that edge that kind of goes that way, right? So rerouting topology is sometimes important. Um, there's another way I can do that that's a little easier though. If I just grab that edge, I think it's under, I always have to find this one here. Spin edge backwards, spin edge forward. You'll see it's control alt left or right. right? If I spin it backwards, it just kind of rotates it, right? So control alt. Um, and so that's going to help you because sometimes maybe um, maybe you need that topology. Let's say if I had this topology and now I wanted to um, grab these faces and extrude those outward, I can get that very specific shape of that bulge in there, right? Um, So is that making sense? Um, what I'm going for there? 
Now, the other method is sometimes I need topology that just isn't existent, right? Like if I needed a, let's try this. If I needed a create polygon primitives, I'm going to get a pipe. Um, let's do this. Right. I'm going to drastically reduce this thing here to So if I need to connect that pipe into this object's head, um, like that can be kind of difficult sometimes, right? Um, and what, like, or if I need to get this shape, I guess a better way of saying that is if I need to get that shape to like grow out of this character's head, that can be difficult. So sometimes what I do is I just make two pieces. I'm gonna make this. Um, I'll maybe go ahead and give it one more height division just for this reason. Um, I will go in here, delete those faces, go in here and figure out where I need these to connect into and then I'll just start connecting them. So the way I do that is I have to go to mesh, combine those two meshes, right? And then I can delete some of these faces. I think I can do it this way. Maybe a little too much. Let's try this. Um, and then I can start connecting these together, right? So I go to my uh, mesh tools and it's the target weld. Where is that at? Target weld, right there. And so I can drag this point down to this point and start welding these pieces together. Right? Now eventually you're gonna see that it's not gonna line up perfectly. Um, and in that case, I may need to do an additional edge loop in a few spots, right? Do as much of this as I can though. And then to get these extra pieces, maybe I just insert some edge loops. Or I can do, again, that edit mesh, um, multi-cut, right? And I can cut from there, like there. And then I can do the target weld. From, it's kind of hard to see here. Um, from there to, oh, I don't want that. I don't want multi cut. Right. So now I'm connecting those together. When I hit three, hopefully we'll start getting some topology there that makes that makes sense. Right. Um, now it's working here a little bit. It's not working over here. I'd have to go in there and fix that. Right. <laughs> Um, it's a little bit of work. It really is. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's easy. It's not. Like, there, there's things that we're going to have to kind of fight to make this work. Um, but it's worth fighting to get that better topology that you want, right? Now, one of the things that you can do, and I'm going to show you this tool a little bit more later, is the, the um, retopology or retopologizing tool, right? Um, which is, again, if you're not familiar with this, over here in Maya, you got this little hammer up here next to this box. That's your modeling toolkit. So um, the way you retopologize, and we're going to cover this in, I guess, in the next class, is using this quad draw tool here. For quad draw to work, though, you need to identify a mesh that you're going to be quad drawing on, right? Um, and so let me just kind of show you this. Let me hit W to get out of the quad draw tool. Go back to my object mode. Um, I'm just going to select this uh, mesh here, and then I'm going to click this little magnet, and that's going to make my selected object live. What that means is that if I created any new objects, now this mesh is like the world that that new object lives in, right? It's going to stick to it, every surface of it, right? Um, so the new objects I want to make are new polygons. So if I go to quad draw, 
you'll see that when I start clicking, it starts making these points on our model. Right? And then later, if I want to turn these into polygons, I just hold shift and it creates this new mesh. Right? So I can really quickly, if I wanted to give my character like a weird hat or something, I can very quickly start doing that. I can also hold control to slice that. Um, and so it's very, um, and then I can middle click to move individual points. So quad draw is a really powerful tool. Um, we're actually going to get into that later. I'm going to show you like how to take something from Mudbox or ZBrush and get a usable topology out of it that um, that you can use in your animations, right? So I'm able to get a completely different topology. It's a separate model, so I have to turn off this, right? But now I have this um, different model here that I could use to create a hat out of this or, or whatever I need, right? So this is this is a really useful tool. So I'm going to file new scene. I do not want to save my new cylinder head. Um, now where quad draw becomes very useful is in stuff like this. Now this is not a sculpt. This is photogrammetry. This is a bunch of photographs I took of a sculpture um, from the Ledoux Topiary Gardens. Um, if we sort of tumble around it here, you'll see that it's like it's pretty detailed. It's got all of this like intricate detail in there. And if I hit four, where you can see the wireframe, right, this is a really dense mesh. Right? It's also made out of a, a whole bunch of little tiny triangles. Not very useful. <laughs> so using the quad draw to draw on top of this and get a usable mesh. Um, this is a pretty complicated shape, right? Um, to use quad draw to, to draw on top of this and get a, a complicated mesh is, um, is sort of the, the way we would do that. So I'm going to show you some of that um, later in class. So just recognize that that exists. Um, I want to pull up a couple of new models um, just to look at stuff, sort of talk about it. I made a folder. Where's my folders? that real quick. Ah. So DIGM faculty, Marlowe, science models. Okay. So um, I wanted to show you this one sort of first. Um, Mudbox is like this. This was my first attempt at a sculpt in Mudbox. Okay, um, I tell you that like it's because the tools are actually pretty intuitive to use. Um, if you're needing to model something more DNA, like a face, I would start there. I would not start with a sphere in Maya. Right? Um, like you can start getting these shapes. This mesh is all but unusable, right? But we can turn it into a usable mesh. Um, this is a, a long time ago, but that's just like my first attempt at it. Um, I will show you this. I don't think that the the high res mesh will come in with this, but maybe it will. Do 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 do. All right, Is it asking me questions? Sometimes it asks me questions and doesn't tell me it's asking me a question. So while it's doing that, I'll open up some other stuff in one of these others. Or not. Or my whole There we go. So this is a cow model. Um, this was completely done in, um, I think, Mudbox. And then retopologized in uh, Maya. So I'll show you kind of briefly. That's the mesh for the high res cow. Look at that. Look at all of those little bitty boxes. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hide that. This is the retopologized model. All right. This is cleaner topology that I've made for this. 
Um, it's actually still not completely uh, finished because the inside of the mouth is kind of incomplete. Um, but really, like, not a bad um, transfer, right? Um, and the reason I show you this is because, and we'll, we'll look at this more later, is that you can focus on just the forms in mud bubbles. You don't have to worry about your topology. Then you can bring that back into Maya and get a usable topology, right? a usable flow. So I think the best way to model is when it starts getting so complicated that you're fighting with form and flow, right? Um, just disconnect them. Like, just focus on form, get the right form, and then do the edge flow later. Uh, I think that the retopologizing tools make that easy enough to do. Now, in most, a, a lot of cases, you can look at it and be like, uh, you know what, I think I, can, I think I can do both of them at the same time. And, and the more you model, the easier that gets. Like, that's what we were doing with the top of that character's head, with putting a cylinder on there. I'm like, ah, that's a little difficult, but I think I can do it, right? Um, but when you can't, like, don't, like, fight forever with that and end up with a topology that you are stretching in an unnatural way to get a certain shape. Just get the shape first and then build a topology on top of it. Um, well, I'm going to go through the process of this next class period, but um, not right now. So when we were talking earlier about do you need to make it one object or two, right? Um, I thought I'd show you a couple of examples. Um, I have a locker we can look at, right? Um, and you can kind of break apart where I decided was this one object or two. Um, so I have this sort of base shape, right? I think I have this rigged together a little bit so you can see it a little bit better too. Um, so I have this base, this piece, right? And that's a very simple shape, right? I also have this shelf on the inside, an even simpler shape. Um, and all of, all of this is one mesh um, because I grouped it. I made it out of different objects, right? So that's a separate cylinder, that's a separate box, these pieces are separate. And if I just go to mesh and separate those, you can kind of see those individually, right? There's the door, um, the handle, the cylinders, right? So making like wise decisions about what parts actually need to be separate, um, like that's just a, a it, it's not going to hurt it to all be different pieces. If you need it to move together, you can always group it or you can combine it the way I did this locker door, right? It's showing as one mesh. If I move it, it will move as one mesh, um, but it's made up of a whole bunch of different topologies um, and different selections of faces, right? Um, it's another example, um, sort of a, a school desk, right? Um, the seat is one piece. Those two legs, they would probably actually be one piece. So I made them one piece. Um, I'm thinking that this will eventually go into some form of game structure. So I kind of tried to simplify it a little bit. There's a chance that this little foot part would actually be a separate piece. And if I were modeling this high enough resolution, um, I would have separated that. These are all made out of separate pieces. I just combined them. Um, don't feel like you have to combine those, though. Like the, it's nice sometimes to be able to move it all around. But you can see that the number of pieces of this, like we got at least six pieces to make up this object. And if I broke this apart, that would, that would make it even more, right? Now, I did some interesting stuff with this. Um, I, I, like this mo um, model right here, um, I, don't, I don't even remember why I was doing this, but occasionally it would get a little too dense and I would simplify it, right? So let me, let me just kind of show you what I'm talking about. Um, I'm gonna duplicate this. Um, if I go to mesh and smooth that, where's like smooth, right? and go ahead and crank up my divisions to like two, right? 
So now I have this object. It looks good, but it's way too dense, right? Um, we also have this, um, let me just go ahead and delete my type history. We also have this reduce option right here. And so if we open that up, you'll see it tries to reduce the amount of polygons in there. If we start cranking that up even higher, it will simplify it, but still try to maintain that form, right? And eventually you're going to get too low and it's not going to be that form anymore, right? But there's a point in there where this mesh gets way easier to manipulate, way easier to look at, um, but still is pretty much holding the same form, right? Like that's not really that much different. Now, I will say it's not very symmetrical, um, but that's okay for me right now. I'm not too worried about that. Um, and so like, if I needed this to be much, I, I reduced it by 98%, right? Um, and from a distance, you don't really notice that much of a difference, right? Um, especially if I smooth it. So there are some things like that you can use in terms to reduce some stuff. Um, it is not a workable workflow, though, to go back to that um, squirrel I had open a minute ago and just hit reduce by 98%. Like, it's still just a mess of triangles. The way it, like, it would never deform correctly if I needed it to deform. Um, and again, like, when do you make this multiple pieces? Um, another model I created. Um, this is going to mess up the materials because it was made with mental ray. Um, so what I'm going to do is just select all of that and assign a new material to it so we can see it. So this is um, the Europa Clipper. Um, the Europa Clipper is an actual theoretical, I don't think they've built it yet, um, it's a theoretical um, uh, satellite that we would hurdle at Europa, which I think is one of Jupiter's moons, or if I'm not mistaken, it's either Jupiter or, I don't know, it's one of the further planet's moons. Um, Europa has like this, these uh, tufts of steam that come off of it, or like these like, um, uh, like eruptions of steam. And the idea with this is that this clipper would fly through that steam, collect data from that, and, um, and analyze it to see if there's actually any evidence of life, right? Because in theory, if there's water, you know, life is potentially developing on that planet. And so there may be microscopic organisms that live on some distant moon in Jupiter. That would be what this is for. Um, and so this was like, it's got a lot of little bitty pieces. Like, why would I ever try to model that out of one mesh? Like, this for the most part is made up out of pretty simple objects, right? Like, that's just a cylinder with a cap on it, right? That I, I bulged out to make that pill shape, right? This is just a box that I've scaled in to kind of give it this bevel. Those are just cylinders, like straight up. All of this is just cylinders. But when you look at how all of this combines together, hopefully it's got enough complexity that it, it reads as um, a, a complicated model, right? So in your first class here, where I gave you a bunch of boxes and said put this together into a bridge, right? This is a much more complicated version of that exercise. Um, this isn't an extremely um, complicated project. Now something that, this is just my pet peeve, and so since I um, am the teacher, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to tell you to not do this. Like, this is a box, right? Um, and it will render like a box, right? If we have some lights in here, let's go ahead and throw a Skydome light in there, Arnold, open Arnold render view. Um, oh, that's interesting. Let's not do it that way. Let's do a um, lights, area light. there. Okay. 
Okay, so that's rendering like a box. Um, but the thing that drives me nuts is that nothing is machined to that precision, right? Um, if you look at the edge on the back of my monitor here, um, that is not that sharp. I would cut myself on that box, right? Because that edge is so precise. Even if you get up here close, like sometimes before class ever, get up here close and look at this little metallic edge on here. It is pretty sharp, but even it has a tiny, tiny bevel on it, right? And so I want to show you just the difference in what that does. If I um, just duplicate this box, move it over here. In this um, model, if I just go through here and grab, I can probably grab all the edges, right? And go to Edit Mesh Bevel. First, it rounds all of them off. I'm going to pull that fraction back significantly. So something like, let's do 0.05, right? And then maybe add a couple of extra segments in there. Maybe even one. I could do two, right? Now, when I render those boxes now, you notice the difference in them, right? Um, that box right there has like this edge that kind of catches the light a little bit and bends the way the light falls off around that corner, whereas this looks like a computer made it, right? That is a really um, kind of crucial part about making a model not feel computer generated, is those little parts of the mesh that catch the light. You can fake some of those in texturing if you need to. Um, but it's for, for what you're doing here, most of you are going to be rendering it. it I mean, if it's a stationary model, um, go ahead and put those little bevels in it so it catches the light and renders a little nicer. Um, or just kind of be on the lookout for that. You don't have to build for everything, but when you notice something, like, that's just looking too sharp. I just round it a little bit, right? OK. Um, I think that the last thing I want to talk about at form flow function, I do want to show you what I'm talking about with function because this is coming up in the near future. If you need to rig something, um, it's going to be an issue, right? So um, what I'm going to do is very quickly make a little simple rig, right? Not, not a full rig, but I'm just going to make a front view. And I'm just going to put um, one height division in there. So most of you can see, right? Now there's my four vertices. And I get this one division right there, right? Now, if I were to create a skeleton for this, create joints. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit different. Move my object up to here. Um, skeleton, create joints. Oh, wait, I'm doing this just so I can start it. Oh, sorry. Start it right here at my origin point. Um, I want to put my next one right there at that bend. There's the top. Now, if I skin this, and rotate this, watch what happens at that bend point. See how it collapses? Right. That's because we don't have enough volume in this mesh to retain that shape. Right. It's trying to deform the weights from this point to this point. Right. So I'm going to undo that back before it was skinned. Right. And I'm just going to grab my mesh again, and I'm just going to insert a couple of other edge loops in there. So I'm just going to go to modeling, um, mesh tools, insert edge loops. I'm just going to put one on each side of that. So now if you look right there, vertices, got, can you kind of see that? we got three of them there now, three edge loops. Um, and if I skin that now, It's not going to be perfect, but my deformation is not going to quite lose as much volume, right? 
And I can probably work with that if I needed to. Um, so we're getting a little bit of a better deformation, right? So when I say function, that's what I'm talking about. If your model is going to deform, you need to make sure that your edge flow um, is capable of um, withstanding that deformation, right? Um, so uh, we can we can look at a lot of stuff in topology and see areas where those decisions are being made um, to where let's find yeah this is a pretty good example so this is an, an overdrawing of like your edge flow of your face and you see these like concentric rings that are going around the mouth and the eyes um, to allow for that deformation right um, we're seeing areas like, um, let's go ahead and use this one as an example. Um, areas like this where your mesh is either there to retain the volume or to allow for the deformation. But it's also there to help like create that very specific form, right? Um, like the arms have a lot of concentric rings in it, um, but those rings don't go in this perfectly straight line. So they're there to build that muscle and help retain that shape as they deform. Um, other things that you'll, um, this isn't a great example of that. Let me see if I can find one. Um, so this is a good example. Things you'll notice about this is that the way, a, a, the way a lot of people want to do, um, to do a model with a, a character is they get to the bottom of the torso and like that's just a box shape and they just extend the leg straight out of that box. Um, that's not how it is. Like your, your pelvis is kind of more like a triangle shape. If you wouldn't look like how the edge flow would naturally look, imagine a character doing the splits, right? That's, or at least like standing like very, like, like that's the way your topology is sort of naturally flowing, right? Um, and so that's how you're gonna get better deformation. Right? Um, if you think about it, your legs can kind of bend out to the side a little bit for that reason. And so like, there's a lot of little things with topology, and it, should, it is a whole class, if not multiple classes, a whole major, on how to focus on getting good topology. I think hands are really complicated, faces are really complicated. Um, and you'll notice in stuff like this, uh, this is actually, um, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to create anything with Blender. Um, I'm find examples. Yeah, here we go. You can see these, like, the flow of very specific edge loops, right, where they're going. And, and topology is important even if you're not going for realism, right? Uh, the topology is helping us get some very specific form out of this and making sure that those forms retain their shape when it starts to deform, right? This character smiles, you want his nose to still stay very boxy and his brow to stay very sharp. Right? So that's the sort of the point of, of the, um, the three Fs, right? Um, so form, flow, function, and I would say like, when in doubt, favor form, because flow and function can be I did not mean for all the words in that sentence to start with X or F. Uh, favor flow and f uh, favor form because flow and function can be fixed. I don't get a tattoo of that. Not really. Um, right, form, like, no matter what you do, you can change your topology all day long. If the model's ugly, the model's ugly. Right? Um, right. So, any, maybe that's why. <laughs> that's the tattoo. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. Um, so, questions, comments? I will say that a lot of modeling issues come from the fact that you didn't know there was a tool for that, right? There, there are a, there's a tool for everything in modeling. If somebody can come up with a way, if somebody can come up with a need for it, somebody has created a tool to fix it, right? So, um, I would say that one of the most helpful videos you could probably watch is that variety of modeling tools um, that I show. Um, I'd be happy to show you some of that uh, in person if you have questions. 
um, stuff like target weld, um, extruding along an edge, um, how to, to maintain um, certain forms, all that, all of that thing. So, um, so check that out and it'll go to a handful of tools that um, will extend your modeling capabilities beyond extrude, right? Um, which is sort of the, the first one we, we sort of get a good grasp of. So. Next class period, I'm going to go over some basics of Mudbox. Um, I'm going to give you the option if you want to use ZBrush, you can. Um, and then uh, I'm going to show you how to retopologize uh, whatever you get out of there. I'm also going to talk to you about photogrammetry. So some of you may be able to utilize photogrammetry to get um, a model that you want to work with. It's one of the reasons I created the Talking Statue uh, project is because people have statues and I'm like, we can do some photogrammetry to get your model, spend more time animating, right? Uh, if that's something you want to do, I can help you um, achieve that. Um, but you'll just have to, I'll, I'll kind of give you the overview of how that works next class period, the overview of how Mudbox works, and then some basics of how to get um, better topology. So, any questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the video, save the video, upload the video, and then hang out until uh, until you all are done with me. So, the rest of the class is yours. I feel like Captain Planet. The power is yours.